Hi, my name is Holly Fitzpatrick, and I am here with Sister Cheyenne Demure, also known as Shoei, I believe. Shoei, yes. Shoei. Uh, today is September 10th, 2021. I am recording from remotely from Lafayette, Indiana to talk about LGBTQ activism in Colorado. And where are you recording from? I'm in Colorado Springs currently. All right. And um, when did you or your family first come to Colorado? Um, I'm a native, actually. And where in Colorado have you lived? All up and down the Front Range, from Fort Collins to Pueblo, a little bit of time in Canyon City. But the majority of the life's been between Denver metro area and the Springs. OK. Um, what kind of background did you grow up in, like class and religion? Um, we were your classic tr white trailer trash growing up <laughs> and extremely Catholic, which made life interesting as a queer, um, <laughs> especially since I didn't even know that was an option. I thought it was just an excuse to get beaten up. Absolutely. <laughs> and what can you elaborate more what it was like growing up queer in Colorado? Well, in my generation, we didn't have things like the Parasol Patrol. We didn't have groups protecting our gay students. There were pride events um, one weekend a year. That was it. And uh, I don't think Colorado Springs even actually had them for most of the time I was growing up. Denver did. And the only way I was permitted to attend as if I wanted to be part of the protesting group. And that didn't seem right to me because I had this weird idea that Catholicism, Christianity was based on this whole concept of love, um, which hate protesting didn't exactly fit that for me. Um, so between that and growing up very Catholic um, to the point where my parents pulled me out of sex ed in the public high school and junior high because they taught about condoms. Uh, I didn't even know that it could be an option until I think it was eighth or ninth grade, a friend of mine went through a divorce and it found out, came out during the divorce that he was bisexual, which for me, okay, good on you. I guess you like guys as well as girls, whatever. And all of a sudden, my family, this guy had been pretty much an uncle and brother to me for most of my life since I was like eight, is not allowed at the house. He's not allowed at family gatherings. And I'm discouraged to go over to his place. Well, screw that. He's been my brother and my uncle. I don't really care who he's having sex with. It isn't me. <laughs> and that's when I first started really coming to terms with the fact that my values didn't align with my parents and my religious community and that I wasn't okay with it. Um, in sixth grade, a classmate and I played doctor. Um, we were both assigned female at birth. And it wasn't until last year that it actually dawned on me that what I did with her is the th same things I do now with my girlfriends. And so really my first sexual experience was with another woman at an age where most people do go exploring. Uh, <laughs> but for the longest time, I thought my first sexual experience was when I was raped by a man. And I didn't even realize, even years after realizing I'm pansexual, having girlfriends, it hadn't dawned on me that what we did when we were playing doctor was having sex because I'd been trained so much of my life that it was tab A, slot B, and that was it. Yeah, the only thing we didn't use were dildos because we didn't have any in my sixth grade. God, I can only imagine how horrified my parents would have been if I had, had those. <laughs> and how has the queer community in Colorado changed in the years that you've lived here? It's become a lot more out. Um, in the 80s and even early 90s, you didn't talk about it. There were a few places you could go to hang out. Um, 
And if you knew the right words, you could talk to somebody else and get in there. Um, there was the eagle if you were a dude, but um, I didn't know at that point that the eagle actually did welcome women. I just wasn't a dude. So, uh, and there was the triangle if you were a kinky dude. Uh, and that one actually for a while insisted that it was cis men only. So for, for women, I didn't know where our spaces were. I didn't know where we belonged. And it was a, something you didn't talk about. You didn't really do much with. Um, it wasn't until the early 2000s that I actually started realizing, hey, there are gatherings. There's places where we can hook up. There's different, there's actual bars and social groups. And, and, and there's this wonderful thing on the internet where we can find each other that changed so much of it from being hidden to where we don't have to just hide and then come out one week into year and hope our bosses don't see us. It's we can be out the entire time now. Um, most of us anyways, with some there's still morality clauses and contracts. Um, Colorado Springs is still home of focus on the family and that has not changed. Um, I do get called some interesting terms on occasion when I'm out with my girlfriend or in my non-binary presentations and that part sucks but it's I'm not as scared as I was earlier in my life I mean earlier in my life if you identified as queer if you identified as gay you were going to get beat up at school period it really wasn't a conversation or anything until oh wow I'm so going to I have a brain injury so I have aphasia there was the uh gay student up in Wyoming who got beaten and hung on the fence. And it wasn't until that happened. Matthew Shepard, there it is. I knew it would come to me. Aphasia, it's a thing. Um, it wasn't until that happened that the conversation started about, hey, maybe we shouldn't let people bully each other for that. And at that point in time, I was almost out of high school. And I was scared going to college. Because the only difference was he was a gay guy. I was a queer chick. Um, what the fuck? Was I going to survive? How this, was this going to happen? Was I going to have people try and rape me straight? Um, rape, yes. Raping me to try and make me straight. Thank God, no. Um, <laughs> yay for dodging that bullet. But it was awkward. It was ugly. And one of the reasons I decided to live my life as out as I do is my sisters both decided to have kids. I'm the oldest of three girls. And I did not want my nibblings, nibblings is the gender neutral term for nieces and nephews, for people who don't know it. Um, I did not want my nibblings to grow up so as sheltered as I was, as unaware as I was, and have to hide or even be told what they are doesn't exist. I mean, the fact I was in my 40s before I realized I'd been having sex with women since sixth grade. Uh, <laughs> yay for enlightenment, but it'd be nice to know that was an option throughout. Um, doing things like the parasol patrol. We had some students out in Castle Rock. The Gay Straight Alliance Club was going to meet, and they had a bunch of idiots stand outside and throw food at them and water bottles and call them all sorts of derogatory slurs. And the parasol parade showed up and we lined up with our flags and our umbrellas and just stood on the sidewalks cheering for those students and letting people know, hey, you're not alone. The principal decided to stay as late as we would to talk to any parents who wanted to talk. Um, I kind of wish you'd been talking to the parents before this. But I can only imagine how much of a difference that would have made to the young lady that I was in junior high, knowing that I wasn't alone and that there were others like me and that there were people who would stand up, even complete strangers who would stand up against the hate crimes. It wasn't something that happened for me. And that's part of the reason why I do what I do is because it would have made such a difference in my life. I would have had many yes, less years of therapy battling shame and accepting myself 
if these were there. And my husband and I had decided not to have kids. Um, I'm self-employed, so my boss isn't exactly going to fire me. No concerns about a morality clause there. And he's of the opinion that if his work wants to fire him because he's married to a queer, he doesn't want to work for them. And we have the freedoms to be able to do that. There are still places both in the state and in the country where those things are risks for people. They, will, they could lose their kids. They could lose their jobs. So I could afford to be out. And as it turns out, I, at birth, it looked like I had four nieces. Uh, you'll notice I do not use the term nieces anymore. I use nibblings. I am not the only she, they in my family. And I will leave it at that because my nieces' stories are theirs to tell, as is my nibblings. Um, but they were able to come to me throughout their entire life. And in my family, I'm Nana. Yes, I'm the aunt, but I'm Nana. And do things like one of them when she was eight. Oh, God, was so sweet. Nana? You have a girlfriend, right? Yes. Is it nice? I like it. Okay. And then she wandered off, scarred for life, I tell you, completely scarred for life. Sure enough, she gets into high school, she starts dating, and she ends up dating this beautiful trans woman. They were very cute. Their prom pictures were fabulous. But that's not a conversation I had anybody I could have it with when I was eight. And so just getting to be there and do that for her and seeing how much has changed between my generation and the next, it warms my heart. It makes me want to cry. <laughs> I'm curious what aspects of your identity are most important to you? <laughs> as Cheyenne Demir or as Xiaoyi? Uh, either way. <laughs> Um, as Cheyenne Demir, my goal is the aspects of my identity are love in all its wonderful forms. That's one of the reasons why I had heart cheeks. The other is I can't contour to save my life. So this gets me out of it. Um, and being as fabulous as possible, because let's face it, honey, you think you're super queer, come stand next to the drag nuns and the sisters of perpetual indulgence here, and you will be nowhere near as the queerest person in the room which gives people so much comfort and openness to be themselves. And they come up and they share their stories with you. And they ask, how do I get to be me? And you all tell them you already are, and you can always be you. And they just walk away glowing and smiling. And that's it. And Jowry, my alter ego, has some of that too, where she just wants to be a safe space for people. Uh, Jowry is she, they as well. Um, just discovered that during the COVID lockdowns, during some introspection, uh, had done identity questioning before, but at that point in her life, it was, are you a girl or are you a boy? We didn't have the non-binary options in that world at that time. Um, and this part's going to suck. I hate having to run up to this part, but when I was getting to the age where you went to bars, we used to win drinks betting on people's gender by a game of she, he, or it. You would all place your bets and whoever won would buy drinks for every, would get drinks bought for them by everyone else. And I had a tendency to win because I was the one who was willing to go up to these wonderful queer trans individuals and go, so great tits, they look fabulous. By the way, he, she, or it, which is not the right way to ask anyone for their pronouns. Bad call, time out, don't do it, don't go there. Um, I was clueless, but those folks gave me so much grace. They would answer my not so great questions about how <laughs> And what gender they were. And I'd have conversations with them and they showed me so much grace. And what well, honestly, I look back and I'm mortified that I would do that. But they showed me grace and compassion and they knew I wasn't asking maliciously. I wanted to know and I did engage with them as a person. 
And so for Shawi, she wants to be that same sort of person. One of her major values is, can I be a safe space? Can I be an ambassador of what it is to be queer and not be the angry queer? Don't get me wrong. We all have rights to be the angry queer. There is enough going on in this world towards queer people that we have a right to be pissed as hell. But I would have spent so much longer not knowing and recognizing those were my people. I was one of them. And they adopted me I, totally for a while. It was one of those. And this is Sherry. She's our straight. I was their token straight person. I'm like, uh, okay, this is weird. Um, they knew I wasn't straight. I hadn't figured it out yet. They were fully aware of it. <laughs> and just being that ambassador and showing people that, oh, look, it's that queer freak. You think I'm dressed like a freaking nun with glitter, people? And you want to call me a queer freak? Do you think this look came by accident? Hello. <laughs> and it helps shield those who aren't able to be this out and fabulous and this over the top. And the sisters of perpetual indulgence are all over the top and then some. <laughs> so when there were a few people talking about starting a chapter here in Colorado. I heard about it. I sent a message going, how can I be involved? How can I help? What can I do? Well, evidently I can be the abbess of the Rocky Mountains cloister of uh, the Golden Nugget Sisters, which is our group. <laughs> and you will never meet a more amazing group of women and guards than our sisters. We are... Mm, I love them. I love them all. They are crazy bitches and I love them. <laughs> and what is the significance of your sister name? <laughs> Cheyenne Demir. Uh, Cheyenne Demir started as my burlesque name because honestly, the difference in how I'm presenting right now and how I am as Shawi isn't much. So the only way I would ever be Cheyenne Demir is if it became a stage name. And I tied that stage name as the burlesque dancer into my sis story. Sis story is the story of the sister. And Cheyenne started as a burlesque dancer who then learned she could take off her clothes for charity and he follow this wonderful calling. And my sister persona will still do burlesque. But it was the only way I would ever be shy or demure. So I am Cheyenne demure. <laughs> <laughs> Can you go into the history of the Golden Nugget Sisters a little bit? I can. We are a very, very young chapter. Um, we are the third group of people who tried to start a chapter of the Sisters here in Colorado. Um, I'm not a completely aware about what happened with the first group. Uh, the second group were trying to be the Swiss Sisters of the Flaming Peaks. And uh, they just didn't follow through with actually doing the paperwork to become and going through the process of becoming Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. Um, sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, because we are an order of queer drag nuns promoted to bringing joy into the world. It's not something you just dress up like a nun and walk out your front door and you are one. There's a process and a system you go through. Um, just over a year ago, our first manifestation was actually a year ago this past October. So I guess we're coming up on two years. Holy crap. Where does the time go? Um, but the October just before COVID, so 2019, uh, was the first time we professed in public and we all dressed up and we went out and we did a bar crawl on Dia de los Martos. And we had gathered together before that a few times. Uh, I think our first official meeting was at Charlie's, which is one of the gay bars in Denver. And we sat in the back room and we're like, yeah, we should all do this. This will be great. This will be fun. What the fuck are we doing? Um, and we decided we would manifest on Dia de los Martos, which it, manifesting just means we dress up and we go out. Um, and we share our blessings with the clubs. And we did. And it was a blast. And people were so excited to see us. And we reached out to the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence and just said, hey, we're a thing and we want to be your thing. How do we do it? And they sent us a manual. Okay, it was only like this, thick, but there's a lot of 
steps and check boxes. And we started working towards it. And at that point in time, we had five members, no, six members. Yes, six members at that point in time. Um, and great, because you need five for at least a year in order to become a mission. And mission is the first step, and then you can get all the way to a full house. Um, it's almost as much fun as a full house in poker, but there's a lot more glitter involved. We thought it was great. Now, Sister Who is not a sister of perpetual indulgence, but I have to mention Sister Who when I talk about our sister story, because when you think of drag nuns in Colorado, Sister Who has been doing it for decades. She is the drag nun of Colorado, and we are actually working on interviewing her for our own history project to add her sister story on our website. She and the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence have talked back and forth. She's kind of an honorary member, but she's her own special thing, doing her own thing too. So she's been out here doing the mission for years and years and years. I think some years longer than some of our current members have been alive actually. It's a frightening thought. Uh, and so we're excited, we're building up, we have plans for all these different projects and COVID hits. How do you go out and make people feel safe when nobody can go out? How do you find ways to show up for a community that has a lot of people with suppressed immune systems during another crisis? Because for the queer community, this wasn't our first pandemic. For Shawi, it was her first pandemic because grown up Catholic, the only thing I knew about the AIDS pandemic was, how do you spell HIV? Are you positive? And that it was a bad thing if you were positive. That's all I knew because Catholic school, that's all you knew. It was the illness that killed the gays because gays are against God. I'm like, I don't think that's what God is, but okay, father, whatever you say. It's one of the reasons I love getting to be a sister of perpetual indulgence now is it shows off that yeah, I'm a religious figure of love. Thank you very much. So there's a little bit of that going on for me. But back to the cis story, <laughs> sorry, tangents. <laughs> um, we started doing Zoom call-ins. We, uh, we did do a Zoom bingo. Uh, then we found out what the Colorado licensing requirements are for bingo, because we do have Blackhawk here and Bingo, even for charity prizes, counts as gambling. And so we will not be doing another bingo for a little bit because we have to be established five years before we could get the license to do that or partner with somebody who already has that license. Oops. Thank you, the state of Colorado, for not nailing our asses to the wall. Uh, <laughs> we'll be doing other fundraisers and fun things. Uh, but we did that to help keep one of our queer clubs open during it. Um, we did makeup parties, we did joke nights and just hang out with the sisters. We would show up to different queer events that were on Zoom and do what we could to bring our joy. And we continued and we managed to make it past one year with five members. We did have one who ended up leaving us. Um, unfortunately, she just it didn't quite work for her to stay with the vision we were creating amongst the rest of us. And uh, sad to see her go because she was she was the one who first contacted me about it even. So I was really bummed when she stepped away. But the five of us who were still there, we kept doing it. We kept finding ways. We kept making it work. We kept putting on makeup and showing up on Zoom calls looking completely crazy in the native little square. And then as things opened up, um, our youngest member, Sister Cascara, also known as Guard Reese, Reese Treto, it's something to do with coffee, but I'm not sure what the Treto portion is, um, was able to start going out to things and start showing up. And usually we don't manifest unless we're in twos or more, but we had decided, well, you're young and you have a healthy immune system, go you. Um, Many of our sisters have compromised immune systems for one reason or another, including me. So <laughs> they could go out before we could. And so we, they started going out. We would Zoom in different places with them. We'd do our online presence continuing. 
And it's gotten to the point now where we can actually start going out. I've got a mask that's painted like my face. So I can put that on. That's what I did when I went out with the parasol patrol. It feels very weird only to decorate part of my face and not the entire face, but the mask works with it. And I'm not sure I really want this much glitter inside a mask where I'm forced to breathe it. Trust me, it gets in enough places already. Um, and we are continuing, uh, let's see, I got to go down to Phoenix and manifest with the sisters down there during this. We had sisters from Dallas come up and manifest with us in a bar crawl this past weekend. And oh, that was so much fun. Those women, ooh, they don't have to have a good time. And we just, we keep building, we keep growing and we keep showing up. We partnered with Parasol Patrol on a couple of different events. And yeah, we're just continuing to find places we can outreach. It looks like we may be doing something with the center soon. Uh, we did a sit in at one of the diners in Monument. They had uh, kicked out someone when they were there with their same sex partner and their surface animal. Now they said because the surface animal was not in a vest, they that's why they were doing it. However, the person had brought their surface animal in multiple times when they were having breakfast with people who were different gender presentation and it was fine. So we got 13 or so people together. And we all went, went and had a dine in and we made a big Facebook event about it. We invited the press, we told everybody about it. And the owner who was the one who had caused this problem by disinviting the person um, wasn't working that weekend. However, the assistant manager and all the people who were there did a phenomenal job. They were very kind and courteous. Three different people with service animals were all there sitting with people of different genders and same genders. And so we're still doing some of the advocacy and it ties into the sit-ins of the 60s and 70s where you just go and be. Uh, we didn't remember that it was Ren Fair. And so a lot of people were like, oh, are you part of the fair? And we're like, no. <laughs> But that's where we're at now. We've had phenomenal assistance from the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. We are now a mission of them. Uh, so we get to actually save our mission of the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. And we're just continuing to grow. We've got um, two novice guards and a novice sister who have joined us, as well as two other sisters who have moved here from out of state and are looking to connect with us. So we will be around. Keep Keep your eyes open online and around our events in Colorado because we'll be there. What do you enjoy most about working with the sisters? <laughs> um, hmm. Well, I do like the glitter. I won't lie. I love the glitter. I love swapping glitter with other sisters because we stand near each other and it migrates. Um, honestly, what I like best though is the fact Every time we go out, someone comes up and they just start pouring their heart out and they tell you their story. And it can be a story of pain. It can be a story of coming out and how supported they feel. It could be a quiet whispered conversation. Of, can I talk to you? Yeah. So what if I think I'm not straight? So what if you aren't? Is that going to be a bad thing? to, I was disowned by my parents. I've been living out on the street. It took me 40 years before I got my feet on the ground. Every story is different, but they're so heartfelt. And they're so, my story kind of sucks. I did get disowned. I was also old enough that it didn't take me very long to be on my own, living in an apartment. I was not dumb enough and trust me, it was a dumb enough factor in my family to tell my parents I was what I was until I was ready to move out. And in two weeks, I did. Uh, <laughs> so I timed it right for me. Um, but not everybody was able to do it that way. And hearing those stories and being a safe place for people to share those stories with you and being able to hold that space for them and be that shoulder for them to cry on and that person to listen 
and let them know that they are still loved and beautiful. That's what gets you addicted to being a sister or a guard, because some of our guards get it too. Some people want to talk to the quiet people and start the, oh my God, drag queen. Uh, <laughs> but that's what really will get you in for life. Because when people start sharing that sort of thing with you, it just, don't get me wrong. I love dressing up fabulously and fucking with people's heads and doing blessings that may or not may not be highly inappropriate. But it's that connection and that giving people the permission to be themselves and share themselves. That's my favorite part. How do you see yourself in relation to other social and political movements? <laughs> it depends on the movement. If it involves anything with the letters M A G A uh, against, um, fervently against. However, when it comes to human rights, when it comes to racial justice, um, any form of minority issues, I'm there. Um, during the Black Lives Matters marches and events, we showed up on the Zoom calls as the sisters. Tell you what, it's really interesting being in white face, <laughs> an actual clown white makeup white face at these things. They're like, what's going on with you? Oh, we're the sisters. We're here. We're doing this. We're here to support you. What can we do? How can we help? <laughs> we're here to listen and support you um and they accepted that and brought us right in um latino rights yes stop asian hate yep we're there native land rights we're there because anytime there's aggression against any minority group it's against every minority group I'm a gamer, so there's that shirt that says you attack one member of the party, we all roll initiative. Yeah. For those of you who aren't gamers, initiative means we've all stepped up and we're ready to take on the fight. And we are. And I am. Um, in whatever ways I can. Sometimes I'm writing and calling my contacts in the government. I'm pretty sure that they're tired of seeing my name attached to emails. Um, and I'm okay with that until they get it right. They'll keep seeing it. And when they do get it right, I'll send them a thank you card. Uh, and I actually do send thank you cards with a little glitter kiss on it when they do it right. Um, on those few times they voted the way they were supposed to. Uh, because you have to reinforce good behavior as well as bad behavior. And yeah, so human rights, women's rights, we're there. I'm right there with them because we all have to stand up for each other. If they decide that women lose rights, the queers start losing rights. If it's okay to be systematic, systemically cruel to Black people, it's okay to be systemically cruel to all people. And no. <laughs> I don't know how to put that clear. No. <laughs> and are the sisters connect to other Colorado groups? We are building those connections, especially now that we're able to get out again. Um, we offered a few different groups to help raise funds for them during the pandemic. Um, a few said yes. A few said, uh, we don't know what we need, but once we do, we'll contact you. Um, we have been working with we have two local bars up in Denver that have become a bit of home bars for us. One is Trade, and that's uh, the leather bar up there, and then Sweets, which is the Bears bar. And oh, always fun hanging out with Bears. So we do work with both of them. We're, uh, like I said, we're working with the, Colo the Parasol Patrol, and we're building with some of the other groups. We're talking with uh, the Denver Gay Men's Chorus currently about a special little thing we want to do that we're hoping will happen in this year. Um, 
I can't say more than that because it's a super, super sister secret, but it's pretty epic. And we also have been working within the uh, kink community because queer and kink history are entwined. A lot of people now that being queer is a little more accepted want to draw that line and kick the kinksters out. We can't do that. At that point in time, we are creating them versus us. And as a group that's been themed, we should be able to recognize all it is is an excuse to downtrod. And then we start getting, okay, let's kick the trans people out. Let's kick the colored people out. Let's kick the gays out. Let's kick the kinky people out. And guess what? We're back on this list. No, we include all of them. And that's one of the reasons why I use the inclusive flag so much. That's where we started. That's our roots. Being gay was considered kinky. Being queer was kinky. You were a pervert. And so the sisters remember this. And we do a lot of work within the kink communities as well. And there's a ton of overlap actually in Colorado between those communities still. So, and some of my very gay friends with their kids will come and march with the leather contingent in the pride parades. And we love them. Those kids are fabulous. Especially they love the ponies and the horses. Cause like, oh, look at all the ponies. I get to pet the pony. And you're like, I'm being pet by a five-year-old kid. This is not a sexual moment. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and the kids get it. The kids get that the pups and the ponies are playing games. And every so often the kids are like, I want to be a puppy too. And they'll run next to us and bark with the puffs. Fabulous. And we interact with them like that because even the kinksters understand age appropriate interactions. So we do a lot of work with them as well. And we look forward to continuing doing that. Uh, We've partnered with Colorado Leather Fest and did a blessing for their ceremonies and we'll be doing stuff with them again in 2022 when they roll around to an in-person event. So we stay involved and we're always looking for more ways to be involved. Can you elaborate on what the Parasol Patrol is? I can. Um, the Parasol Patrol is a group that was started I know one of the founders is posh. I got to meet her this past weekend. Um, but there was an all ages drag show happening in Denver. And oh, I thought this was a fabulous plan. I was so excited, yay, we gotta go, we got to do things. And some idiots decided that they were gonna go and shout things at these young performers about how inappropriate it was. And somehow by encouraging performances, we are going to send them straight to hell. I'm very confused. Uh, I didn't think theater was the way to go to hell. I don't remember that in the top 10 I learned. Um, but you don't go after kids. The Parasol Patrol is a group of nonviolent counter protesters. And what we do is we stand with large colorful umbrellas with our pride flags between the kids and the protesters. And Parasol Patrol's lined up against MAGA lovers, against Westboro Church people. And we don't shout back, we cheer the kids on, we cheer love, we, about the closest shit you'll hear from us is spread love, not hate, but we don't engage with the people who are doing the protests. We just drown them out with sounds of joy and we block the line of sight so that the people going in to perform or going back to their cars after their performance don't see the hatred. They see a line of people celebrating them. And can you go into the significance of your specific cornet and your habit and that sort of thing? Ah, yes, the one who does know the sisters. So every house has to come up with their own cornet, um, different designs for different houses. And we have the clamonette. It is a clamshell or a toilet seat. Yes, we get several jokes about the throne being on our heads instead of under our ass. We're okay with this. But we decided on the clamshell because we are the uh, 
Golden Nugget Sisters of the Rocky Mountain Cloister. Rocky Mountain oysters are a delicacy in Colorado. Now, truth of the matter is they do not come in a clam shell like oysters do. They are balls. But since we were already making a joke about that, why not put a golden nugget inside a clam shell? And we were trying on, we tried over 17 different styles of cornet. One point we were looking at minor hats because you know we kept the gold rush out here. And, and this was actually the first clamonet ever made because we were trying to see how things worked. Um, it's been modified a little since then. It used to do complete flip top. I've now got a couple of wires that keep it from doing that. And we tried it and we loved it. And we all voted it in. Um, we also traditionally in the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, when you're a fully fledged sister, you are a black veil. You can wear a black veil. Before that, you wear white usually. Um, our novices still wear white, but because we're the Golden Nugget Sisters, fully professed sisters can wear black or gold. I wear both. This is gold cross shot with black because I'm just that fabulous, darling. And it gives us our little golden nugget inside our clamshells, which is fun. Um, when you become a full sister, you get a goodie box that has the collars that are made. So we all have matchy collars and a collection of pins as well as the name badges. Um, before that, we make you a little button that says your name and a if you're a sister, we give you a temporary clam. Our guards currently have little clam pins they can put on, um, but they will be having gold uh, shoulder capes and marks, or our three stages are white, blue, and then gold. So that's how we do that. Beyond that, every sister gets to dress differently on what they do. For pride, I actually one time took this flag and bunched it up as the front drape, uh, we have our formal outfits, which are gold and black brocade and heaven forfend we ever have to wear them anywhere that doesn't have really good AC, that stuff doesn't breathe and we already have the makeup on to where our faces are sweating like crazy. So usually for me, I wear something super slutty. Um, currently I've got a tube dress on because I knew that this was about all you'd see of me. Um, we allow people to wear their club patches and club colors if they are part of another organization. Um, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. It depends on where we're going, what we're doing. And those are the big things for us other than a smile and glitter. <laughs> we do have uh, pins of our own. Um, oh, I gave away my last one. I need to put another one on here. And then uh, Sister Begonia Thoughts amazing sister, not one of ours, but what she likes doing is she likes creating art of all the sisters. And she, this is the art she made for my first manifestation. And we made stickers for each of us. Uh, she also went ahead and made our symbol for the sisters. The Golden Nugget sisters have a logo. And in that logo, there's a piece of each of the original five members. We have a jack-o'-lantern for our guard, Jacko, sitting up on top of the crown. We have a swirl on the forehead that is um, Sister Innocentius. That is her trademark. Um, heart cheeks from me. Uh, the big bushy beard, Sister Minnie. And then uh, it's actually the collar for Reese, because this was Reese's contribution to our kits. Reese got us these. Uh, the entire gift box was not something many of us thought were, was going to happen. And suddenly during the lockdown, we're getting messages from him going, hey, what's your address? Okay, well, here's my address. Ding dong. Hi, ding dong ditch, you got stuff. And we'd get the little boxes that had all the pins in it. And I've added a couple pins since then. I mean, picked them up at Pride events with Parasol Patrol. And this one was actually given to me by a little who was so excited to see the sisters at something that they're like, you need a teddy bear. And I'm like, okay, thank you. You're a good little. 
You're such cute. And for people who don't know what littles are, they are adults who like to be in little kid headspace. And it's just plain pretend as an adult. And let's face it, how many of us could use a little bit more time playing pretend that everything's taken care of and we don't have to adult all the time? There's a reason hashtag adulting is not a happy hashtag. <laughs> And what are some of your personal goals as a sister working with Colorado communities? I haven't thought about my personal goals as a sister in a while. Um, I keep thinking of the sisters goals as a group. Personally, I want to recruit more members. I want to get more people involved in this. I want to help us connect with more of the communities. I am a bridge builder because the more we can work with each other, the better we can be. Um, one group here in Colorado that we have that is phenomenal that I'm hoping we can work with as sisters is the Denver Cycle Sluts. They are one of the best known groups of cycle sluts, longest running for the nation, if I recall correctly. Don't quote me on that. I don't know their history as well as others. I haven't been studying them. I've been studying ours, but they're fabulous people. I've known these performers for years and I want to see if we can partner with them on something. Even if it's as simple as we all show up and play bingo at their bingo games, because let's face it, a bunch of nuns playing bingo is pretty damn freaking funny in and of itself. And then we have the cycle sludge doing their camp drag performances and shows. It's going to be fabulous. But that's my personal goal with the sisters is to do a lot of building those community connections and helping. We have rituals or we're working on having rituals. We're, we're new. So we are literally writing our rituals as we go right now. <laughs> oh, and there goes the climate net again. We're still working on ways to get these things to stay the best. Um, we are also working on materials and all We've only been in house for two years. Eventually we'll figure out a way that we can have it where it stays on our head, is fairly comfortable and can be packed for travel. <laughs> um, but getting to build the rituals, like for those of us who started the house, us five, we're fully professed sisters and guards at this point um, because we've spent two years building the house. We've been doing our work. There are, you have to get a certain number of projects done to advance between the different levels. But once you're there, how do we show that you've transitioned? And we're getting to build those rituals. And that's part of what I'm getting to do is write the rituals up and can figure out what they will be and how they will work. Um, our board meetings are not board meetings. They're called sister busy meetings because it's where we get the busy stuff done so we can party. And we have uh, Father Cluck, who I kind of wish I brought down, but you're very grateful I didn't. He is a rubber chicken that is painted gold. And when he's squeezed, he sounds like someone is dying. It's ah! So you're grateful I didn't bring it because that does not do justice to it in any way, shape or form. But if we get too far off topic during one of our meetings, he goes off and that's one of our rituals is Father Cluck goes ah! And we all go back on topic because nobody wants to hear that fucking sound again. It is horrible. Um, I didn't even ask, am I allowed to cuss during this? It's, it's really up to you. Okay. <laughs> I've been doing really good until right then. Um, and yes, I am the one who is responsible for Father Cluck and making him make that horrid sound. Uh, but it does mean that we get through our busy meetings really quick. We stay on topic. Usually they take at most an hour and then we move on to the socializing and having fun portion of the evening. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear that damn chicken go off. So we've got that little ritual already built in. We've got the handing of, here's a claminette. You have to decorate it. It's plain right now. Don't let us see it plain next time. We do have one loner claminette currently. I made up a spare because it looked like we were going to have one of our novices make it to one of the uh, Pride Parasol Patrol events. But unfortunately, she couldn't make it, so it hasn't debuted yet. Um, I've actually made myself another one. This is the original. And then I have one that's specifically for pride-like events. And oh, it's ostentatious. I love it. Um, so getting to build those rituals, getting to build, what is it like? Will we lick you when you get up to another level? Do we 
sprinkle you with glitter? What do we do to make you your next version? And we also have some of the people who are pups who are becoming guards for us. So we have guard dogs. And to my knowledge, we may be the only house with guard dogs. So I'm very excited that we get guard dogs. And I've also talked to some of the people who do pony play up here and they're like, do you need horses? I'm like, oh my God, we're gonna have sisters with horses. We are gonna be the sisters in the parade and the ponies are gonna be pulling our carts and we're gonna have guard dogs and we'll be like, hi, fabulous. So we're getting those bridges built and I want to continue building those with the different Imperial courts, with groups like the center, which is our transgendered center and just continue building and helping them because the more we band together, the stronger we are. Um, in the leather community, one of my dear friends has the saying shoulder to shoulder, hide to hide. Because when we're wearing our leather vest, you lock shoulder to shoulder, nothing gets through those hides. Nobody can break our circle. And that's both Shawi and Cheyenne's goals is to build that circle larger and larger so that whenever we need to, we put the cow on the outside and let them poke at the armor and put our vulnerable inside and protect them. Which is probably why I love working with the parasol patrol so much too, because it's the same concept. <laughs> and um, what were your projects that you worked on to progress as a sister? <laughs> build the house, build the house. Oh dear God, don't let it fall apart. What the fuck are we doing during COVID? Build the house. Uh, <laughs> We actually did a uh, Trans Suicide Awareness Day memorial. Uh, we each had the different sisters and guards read some of the names of trans individuals who had lost their lives due to outside violence, as well as suicide that year. And then one of our sisters put it together as a recording and we posted that on our Facebook page. Um, we did the bingo fundraiser. We have done a couple different pride events where we actually did get to show up in person. Um, we did a couple pride events where we showed up on Zoom. <laughs> uh, hand. Uh, I don't remember what the acronym stands for, but it's a group with resources and we helped with their website. And as people with AIDS advance in years for the people who survived AIDS, there are complications. There are tons of complications these individuals still live with if they're HIV positive, including memory issues and lots of other things depending on what medications they were and weren't put on over the course of their lives. And so we helped with building the HANDS website, which is a bunch of resources on how to deal with these different things, um, how to find support groups for dealing with the advanced HIV, long-term HIV complications. Um, I wasn't aware of that. I was aware of U equals U, if you're undetectable, you can't transmit it, things like that. I was aware of PrEP, the medication you take if you're going to have sex with someone who has a, is HIV positive so that you do not contract it. I wasn't aware that these complications existed even though two of my sisters had them. Um, honestly, at the moment, we have more people who are spoonies in our chapter than aren't. Uh, <laughs> because I have fibromyalgia as well as brain injuries. So um, it's amazing how many of their complications are very familiar to me. <laughs> so we helped with that. Um, and then we did a, uh, was a celebration, what was the celebration? I should have pulled up our website. It's got them listed. Uh, if you go to goldnuggetsisters.com, uh, there's a list of all the different things we've done. Uh, we did do several makeup parties online where we all tried putting on our face, using our cameras as our mirrors, and wow, that, that did not go well. I did learn many different ways to put on the full face. Um, I didn't do those today because white clown face, I sweat whenever I put on this face, and then with the lighting I have to have for Zoom, it would be dripping and it would look horrible on camera, so I'm doing what we call niche face 
which actually is named after one of the original sisters who didn't do the white face. So that's interesting little sister uh, trivia there. A lot of it was outreach. A lot of it was keeping the group together. Um, we have a Facebook chat that we kind of refer to as our rolling meeting where really it's our rolling chat. We talk, um, sometimes the chats are about who's hooking up with who and what and where, those get interesting. Um, it's one of the few chats where it's safe if you're drunk off your ass to chat because the sisters will forgive you whatever you post. Don't get me wrong, we will harass you about it in the morning when you're sober. And a lot of what I did was just facilitating keeping us together, reaching out to the different groups. Um, Cascara also was phenomenal at that because she is, she's the next generation. She's the generation after mine and her phone and her social media skills are phenomenal. She has found all the pride events and all the varieties and connected us with them um, throughout the past two years. And we've just, we've been showing up where we could. A lot of it was just doing our monthly meetings and having an agenda. And yeah, that was mostly what I did was I just ran the meetings and showed up where they told me to. <laughs> we didn't do a lot of personal projects as the five of us, because we were so focused all the time. Anytime a project was suggested, all of us jumped in to the point where none of it felt like it was a personal project. They were always group projects. And it's my hope that we can help extend that experience to our novices as they come in now so that they don't feel like they're alone. Um, the sit-in was one of our novices' first projects and it went really, really well. They actually had someone reach out to the person who was asked to leave originally and an independent film studio wants to turn it into a movie because of the stuff that was overheard when they found out about our sit-in and why it was happening. And we had these little scrolls that we handed out that had our logo and our website address, but they all had different blessings or different sayings. And one of them was service animals are always welcome with us because of that. And we still hand these out. They've been updated. They now have a QR code as well. The graphics a lot better than the one I slapped in there originally. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we just, we all jump in and help each other with the projects. So it didn't feel like Cheyenne had any projects as she became fully professed. The sisters had the projects, if that makes any sense at all. <laughs> and you spoke a little bit about this, but are there other ways that HIV has impacted the work that you do? Yes. Um, I am actually trained in bloodborne pathogens and how you can and can't get it as a body art modifier or body modification artist, however you want to consider that. Um, so I'm very aware of how it can and can't be transmitted. Um, many of my friends are positive. Uh, Mr. Friendly, that's what this pin is, is actually anyone who's wearing this is more than willing to talk about HIV without discussing your status, whether it's positive or negative, we're still happy. Um, and the Mr. Friendly campaign is a great set of resources for anybody who wants to know more about it as well. Um, both I and my alter ego have one of these pins that we wear all the time. So people come up and talk to me about it all the time, <laughs> which good, that's chat. I've had friends who have come up to me going, I just found out a positive. I have no idea what to do. And we sit in a corner and uh, we just talk. I put my arm around them. I know how hard it is to have a lifelong diagnosis because I've got it with some of my chronic illnesses. Is it HIV? No. Have I had STIs? Yes. So I understand the stigmas there. My STIs aren't quite as likely to end my life but again, when properly treated, people are living much longer. Um, and I've had multiple friends who died due to AIDS complications. Um, I've worked a few events as Shawi to help promote awareness 
of HIV, HIV transmission, and PrEP in particular as a method of preventing it. Um, I reach out and any event I go to, in my bag, whether it's a Shawi or Cheyenne, I've got condoms. I'm trying to get internal condoms as well as external condoms, but finding internal condoms, they used to be called female condoms, can be very challenging. Um, I'm also trying to find a good source of dental dams, but that's a challenge in and of itself. And I just always have them available and give them as blessings or as here's things or put them on a table. And the reason I do that is because barriers make a difference. And hell, I got pulled out of class for trying to learn that these things could save people's lives. Not cool. So I do what I can to make sure they're accessible. All of my nibblings, well, right now, not the youngest because she's five. I get to be out to all my nibblings. The others are all 12 and older. And once they hit puberty, they got a handout from Nana that was, here are what STIs are. Here's how you can get them. Here's the lies about how you can get them. And here's a batch of condoms and internal, both internal and external. Check their dates before you use them. Love, Nana. And I would give them this with their mother's approval and tell them, don't open this till you're alone. You'll be happy. You'll thank me later. Because one, they can't open it in their grandfather's house and usually we hook up at my dad's place. And two, who wants to, when they first reach puberty, get a bunch of sex stuff from their aunt? Ew! So they open it privately and they do whatever they do. And there, it also says in there, if you ever need more, I can provide them for free. They haven't taken me up on it. Um, I have been informed by my sister that it was opened and oh my God, the squeeze of horror were fabulous. Evidently she shared a wall with them. Uh, <laughs> so I do things like that and I help people. When you lose friends, when you lose community members, these people are my family a lot more than my blood family has been. Kathy, my birth mom, died during the pandemic. She had cancer. We knew it had been coming for a while. We never had a reconciliation. She's, to the day she died, believed I'm going to hell. And at best would, quote, pray for my soul. And I'm like, great, good on you. But, you know, since we were also a good Catholic family, I would get disowned around the first of the year, somewhere between the first of the year and Valentine's Day. And then right around Thanksgiving, I'd get re-owned so we could have the family Christmas. And then I've been on that cycle for, God, over 20 years at this point. Um, and it was weird because this past year, she didn't disown me in January, February. I'm like, huh, something must be wrong. And then she passed in May. So I don't want that death it was a thing it was a blood relative who died honestly her death mostly affected me in the fact that i had to deal with more of the bio family my generation on down we're pretty cool with being queer i am completely out there are other queers in my family who are not completely out because they see how my family treats me i had to deal with more of them it was stressful i didn't really want to go but i did because there's familial obligation plus I could be there to be the target and tell people to shut the f up if they started queer bashing which they did the priest even used my dead name during the ceremony way to go father that'll bring me back to the fold and it was awkward however that death didn't mean nearly as much to me as when rich doctor was kind of an uncle to me in the leather community. And he passed away due to AIDS complications. And we had a celebration of life. 
Ruel cried and shared stories and that death impacted me a lot more. And there have been many more deaths to AIDS within my chosen family that have impacted me a hell of a lot more than any bio family has yet. So. And uh, what would you like to most be remembered for as a sister? <laughs> I don't want to be. <laughs> when I think back on myself as a sister, I'm the one who trips over her own skirts more than everybody else, things like that. So I don't want to be remembered as a sister. Uh, <laughs> if anything, I just want to be remembered as someone who picked up chairs and put them down where they need to be put down. I want to be remembered as someone who showed up and did what was needed done. Regardless of whether or not it was, I mean, seriously, showing up to a Black Lives Matters protest and setting up chairs, totally something I'd love to do. Totally something that needs to be done. Totally something the organizers of that event don't need to be doing because they're busy dealing with 27 other things that are a lot more important. So that's the sort of thing I want to be remembered for is just being there to do the work that needs to be done within the organizations we work with. There is an exhibit at History Colorado with 100 objects important to Colorado history. What would be your 101st object? Interactive museum or within cases museum? It is absolutely up to you. <laughs> If it were an interactive museum, I would choose the boot black throne from the old Denver Eagle. It is a ginormous iron throne and it has been part of the community since the 60s. And when the Denver Eagle closed, it vanished. Well, it turned out that it ended up in the burner community Luckily, there was someone who was both a burner and part of the leather community. They were able to get a hold of it, and it is now once again in leather hands. But I would love to have that in a queer exhibit where people can boot black and interact with it and sit in it again. Because the stories that piece of furniture has, the number of people who have hooked up because of talking to somebody in it, or had their leathers cared for. And caring for leathers isn't just about, it's not a shoe shine you get at the airport. It's taking care of the person who wears those leathers. It's about healing the soul while you're working on the souls. Shawi is a boot black and very engaged in this. So um, it's about helping people feel better about who and what they are. The boot blacks are kind of like the father confessors or bartenders of the leather community. They hear all the history and they pass on bits of it. In a lot of ways, they're like the sisters minus the glitter and the fabulous fashion sense. But <laughs> so that would be my 101st piece. And is there anything else you want to discuss that you haven't shared yet? Not that I can think of. The only thing I would have to say really is that there's a lot more of us out there than people realize or recognize. Um, when I did come out, I had so much love and support that I didn't even know was there. Yes, I lost my birth family, but there was another family ready to step in and fill that void with much more love and acceptance. And I want people to know that that's there now. It might take a while to find it, but it is there. And it's not as underground as it used to be. You can find us now, so reach out. And hell, reach out to the sisters, we'll hook you up. We know everybody, or at least we will. <laughs> Thank you so much for spending some time with me today and getting to collect your oral history, you. Mr. Cheyenne Demure. A pleasure. Thank you so much for working on this project and uh, documenting some of our sis story.